worship because when this man comes on the scene, he will crave worship. He will seat himself in the temple of God, proclaiming himself as God. Second Thessalonians chapter two verse four says. We're doing a series through the book of Revelation, and we're up to chapter 13, and study 13, how it coincides, I don't know, but uh, study 13, and we're talking about the rise of the Antichrist. So this chapter of the book of Revelation is probably the most intriguing chapter, most well-known chapter. Uh, in the whole of the book of Revelation because we'll break this chapter up into two sections and we'll come back uh, in a later study to focus on the mark of the beast as uh, we get into it. So tonight we're just talking about the Antichrist and his rise and that those first several verses in chapter 13. You know, this person, the Antichrist, we've read so much about him uh, in the scriptures and uh, we'll focus on uh, what the, some of the scriptures speak tonight. You know, in Hebrew and in Greek, and we'll get into it more next week, there's a way that you, uh, the letters of a person's name can amount to numbers. So you can figure out uh, a person's number by counting the letters in his name. Like, for instance, it's, it's Latin does the same. C is 100, right? X is 10. At, uh, what, what's M is 100, is it? You, you get the picture. So letters have numbers to them, and especially Greek and Hebrew, and we will talk a bit, a bit more about it next week, but you can figure out from a person's name their number. And here in the scriptures next week, we'll talk about the mark of the beast and the number of his name. So there's been a lot of speculation down through centuries as to who is the Antichrist by putting his name into Hebrew and Greek and getting the number of his name. So there's been so much speculation down through the years and, and I'm not going to speculate on people in our present day as to their number. There are people out there that do that in a, a lot more depth than I can in what we're doing. But down through history, people have speculated on who was the Antichrist by looking at the number of their names. And we will not know for sure until that time comes and the man is on the scene. And, and really what we're talking about is we will know who it is by the things that he does. So we're going to look at some of the things that the scriptures tell us ahead of time that this man will do once he comes on the world scene. And of course, uh, there is a lot of encouragement uh, when we read these things. There's, certainly there's warning and instruction, but there's also solace and reassurance. What do I mean, reassurance? When we will find out all the things that are, are, are written about this man and then we see someone on the world scene actually doing the things and fulfilling the things, then that will give us a lot of re reassurance and confidence because we will realize, and I hope you've already realized that, that the scripture is true, that God cannot lie and all scripture is inspired by God, including the prophetic scriptures. And, and of course, uh, a quarter of the Bible is prophetic. You probably know that. So there is so much, and we can only scratch the surface of uh, the Antichrist and some of the things he will do uh, in this study. 
But the, the encouragement is that if God knows the end from the beginning, then we can have confidence that he will completely bring us through any difficult times that we may have to endure. He who has seen the future is still working all things together to the final day. So in our previous study in the book of Revelation, we looked at what I believe is a series of flashbacks. You ever been watching a movie and all of a sudden you see a, a different person, a younger version of someone, you think, oh, okay, what's happened here? And, and it takes you back to try to help to help you to understand the present in the movie. Well, I think that chapters 12 uh, through, through chapters 15 is a flashback to show us that, that the things that will happen will encourage us. God shows us and warns us of these things that will come upon the earth. And of course, we've already talked about them. We're talking about the great tribulation, which is uh, the warning in Scripture by the Lord Jesus. And uh, the Lord wants to prepare his people for Satan's wrath, because the Scriptures does say that when this man comes on the world scene, he will wear out the saints of the Most High. Daniel 7 verse 25 tells us he shall wear out. Anyone feeling worn out? This spirit of the Antichrist is already at work at the moment, even though we don't see the man or we haven't recognized the man as the Antichrist. Yeah, I do believe that this man is alive on earth at this moment, but we are already seeing uh, the the spirit of the Antichrist at work. He shall wear out the saints of the Most High, Daniel 7.25. And the scripture in, in Revelation tells us that he will make war on them. Notice that. Here's what it says. The dragon, we all know who the dragon is, Satan. The dragon was enraged at the woman. Why is he enraged? Because he knows his time is short. The dragon was enraged at the woman and went off to make to wage war against the rest of her offspring. And then John clarifies who is the offspring of, uh, of Israel and the scriptures. And, and we are told those who keep God's commands and hold fast their testimony about Jesus. The saints mentioned in the above verse, Daniel 7.25, are believers in Christ who were on earth during the second half of that seven-year period. Remember, Jesus warned us of the abomination of desolation, and he warned us what will take place after that event uh, of the Antichrist sitting in the temple of God, uh, acting as if he is God. And the Lord said, for then there will be great tribulation such as has not occurred since the beginning of the world until now, nor ever shall, Matthew 24, 21. So God wants us to be forewarned ahead of time about this. So when these things take place, we will uh, have great encouragement that uh, the coming of the Lord will be soon. Knowing these things before they take place will be an encouragement amid a dark time. To be forewarned is to be forearmed, I believe. So how do we know that this time is still ahead for all believers in Christ? After all, some people believe that the events and the book of Revelation was written for that first century AD. Uh, those who believe that the destruction of Jerusalem was the tribulation, uh, what is commonly called preterists, 
A preterist is someone who believes that we shouldn't expect all these things to happen in our day. They're not, they're not happening in our day. They're, they all happened years ago, and the destruction of Jerusalem was the culmination of it all. Those people that believe that are called preterist. So when I see all these prophetic scriptures coming to pass, I, I can't receive that persuasion of the book of Revelation. Why? Because there has never been a time in history when one man has gained control of the whole earth. And the scripture is very clear that this man, the Antichrist, will have authority of Revelation 13, 7, over every tribe, people, language, and nation. Revelation 13, 7. The world system that is ruled by Satan, remember he's called the ruler of this world in John 14, 30, is preparing for some time when his man that he is preparing will control the whole world through decades of manipulation of the resources of the world. And if you look back over decades, you'll see that there are organizations that have gained control over the world's currency, currencies, I should say, over the world's energy, over the world's education, its food, its health and drug system, its armed forces, its political sit systems, etc. We see all of these things taking place, arising in front of us as we look at the daily news. So what will this man do? Let's read now about what happens after the devil and his angels are cast to the earth. Because remember, in chapter 12, we looked at how that, uh, the devil was thrown down. And we won't go over that again. So let's focus now on the beast out of the sea. So we're now going to read Revelation 13, 1 to 4, verse 1. The dragon stood on the shore of the sea... And I saw a beast coming out of the sea. It had ten horns and seven heads with ten crowns on its horns. And on each head a blasphemous name. The beast I saw resembled a leopard but had feet like those of a bear and a mouth like that of a lion. The dragon gave the beast his power and his throne and great authority. One of the heads of the beast seemed to have had a fatal wound, but the fatal wound had been healed. The whole world was filled with wonder and followed the beast. People worshipped the dragon, Satan, because he had given authority to the beast. And they also worshipped the beast and asked, who is like the beast? Who can wage war against it? I know this is, tran is translated there, not him, but it. So I kind of think that this man will utilize AI and all of the IoT that's taking place, the Internet of Things, IoT is commonly called, and what we're talking about is this man is, can listen to everything that's going on throughout the world through all of our devices, our, our refrigerators, our television screens. Have you ever been watching the television and you've made a remark, oh, I'd, I'd love a new refrigerator, and then all of a sudden you get adverts for a refrigerator coming up on your computer and things like that. These devices, we're not aware, but they are listening to us. And some people have 
got certain devices in the in their kitchen tables and talk to it <laughs> and and give it commands but all the time th those devices are listening in compiling all sorts of information that is being used by marketers all over the world now i'm getting away from what i'm talking about the general meaning of what's going on here is that satan is cast out of heaven and he knows that his time is short and is determined to do as much damage to God's kingdom as he can. To cause this damage and to wage war on the saints, he delegates his power to two beasts, two beasts of a man, men, who are the central figures in this chapter, who we're talking about. Satan realizes that his kingdom reign is coming to an end and he has prepared a political structure as the means for one last demonic defense because he is losing, brothers and sisters. Whether you realize it or not, it seems like the world has gone crazy, but he's going, it's going crazy because he is losing to the church. The gates of hell, which speak of defenses, shall not prevail against the church. In other words, the church is advancing and storming the gates of hell and plundering the hell and its kingdom of men and women that God loves. And every day all over this world, the gospel is going forth and, and Christ our Lord is plundering hell of its inhabitants, and he is losing markedly uh, and, uh, and at a faster and faster rate. And what we're reading here is he's got to make one last stand, and he is cast down to earth, and he will inhabit, possess two individuals that is prepared ahead of time, the Antichrist, and the false prophet, and we'll look more at the false prophet uh, in our next study. Uh, we must not listen and obey all the voices that seek to coerce us. Have you ever felt that? We're being coerced, pushed along a certain way. This world system wants to push us to do what our enemy wants us to do. But we as believers must not be coerced and we must not take his mark when it's introduced. John the Apostle warned us how to distinguish false worship because when this man comes on the scene, he will crave worship. He will seat himself in the temple of God, proclaiming himself as God. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 4 says... The Apostle John wrote this in 1 John chapter 4, verse 3, so that we know that when this man comes on the scene, we should not be doing this even now, but even more when this man comes on the scene. John writes, Every spirit that does not confess Jesus is not from God. And there you, you just look out at this world and the blasphemous things that are going, going on, even in the last few days, I don't need to talk to you about it. The blasphemous things that are going on uh, at the Olympics, for instance, with the Last Supper and all that blasphemy. Oh, it, I don't go there. This is the spirit of the Antichrist, John writes. When you which you heard is coming and now is in the world. And it, when John writes this, that spirit was already in the world with the Caesars that wanted worshipping as, as God. Emperor Nero, for instance. He, he wanted worship as God and others too. So let me ask you a question and get your thinking caps on. If the spirit of the Antichrist was present when John the Apostle was alive... We know that he is present today. It is present today. Do you think it is more prevalent 
in our society today? How do you see the spirit of the Antichrist affecting world culture today? Go for it. I'll give you a few minutes just to process that, discuss a little bit at your table. So, in verse 1 of chapter 13, we read of Satan, the dragon, standing beside the sea, and a beast comes up out of the sea. Well, what are we to make of that? Are we talking literally? <laughs> no, we are, we are talking symbolic language. So what does the sea mean in symbolic language? The political system of the beast, Mystery Babylon the Great, is typified as the sea of Gentiles. The waters you saw, Revelation 17 verse 15 says, The waters you saw where the prostitute sits are peoples, multitudes, nations, and languages. So it is our view that the Lord is showing us that the Antichrist will arise from the Gentiles during a time of great social upheaval. And I think that we are being prepared for that time now with the continents uh, and the influx of people. There is an agenda, you can bet, behind all of that. In fact, Luke 21, verse 25, says this. On the earth, and this is Jesus speaking. On the earth, nations will be in anguish and perplexity at the roaring and tossing of the sea. Isn't that interesting? He uses the same kind of picture. So a leader will arise out of the storm-tossed sea of Gentile nations that are in turmoil to take advantage of the situation to grab power, kind of similar to what uh, Adolf Hitler did in the early 30s after the collapse of Germany, after the First, First World War. He, he uh, on the back of all of that, he... he completely grabbed control of Germany at that time. So this man will arise in the midst of all this political turmoil that is being stirred up and prepared even now. And this beast of a man will be allowed to control the political world system. One commentator, John Phillips, in his book Exploring Revela Re Revelation, says this, and I quote, His arguments will be subtle, convincing, and appealing. His oratory will be hypnotic, for he will be able to move the masses to tears or whip them into a frenzy. He will control the communication and media of the world and will skillfully organize mass publicity to promote his ends. He will be the master of every promotional device and public relations gimmick. He will manage the truth with guile beyond words, bending it, twisting it, and distorting it. Public opinion will be to his to command, will be his to command. He will mold world thought and shape human opinion like so much potter's clay. His deadly appeal will lie in the fact that what he says will sound so right, so sensible, so exactly what people want to hear, end quotes. In verse 2, the Antichrist is described as having the same characteristics as the three beasts spoken of in Daniel chapter 7. This likely means that the Antichrist will be a composite of the preceding three kingdoms in history. Babylon was likened to a lion, Daniel 7, 4, and this man, Antichrist, will have the ability to speak great things and exert power over many nations. 
just as Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon did. The second beast is likened to a bear, which we know to be the Medes and Persians. In Daniel 7 verse 5, it references that, which symbolizes the Antichrist's ferocity and power. The third beast, represented by the leopard, is a picture of the Greek empire under Alexander the Great, found in Daniel 7, verse 6. It may be indicative of the speed by which his army traveled to conquer the Middle East and Western Asia in just over three years, Alexander the Great did. Similarly, the Antichrist and his kingdom will have the ability to react with speed to world events. This beast has ten horns, notice. In the scriptures, horns are symbols of power demonstrated in the animal kingdom by animals using their horns to fight. There have been many theories uh, put forth to interpret the ten horns. What on earth is this ten horns? And over the years, as I grew up in Christ, the prevailing thought at first was, was when the European common market came into being at first. I think, if I remember correctly, seven nations. Then it increased to ten, and everyone thought this was it. But all of a sudden, it went to 15 nations. And I think there's about 20 nations at the moment. So, so that kind of disproved that. Uh, and then there's also others have suggested that these horns represent separate countries that arose out of the Roman Empire through, ta through time. Some people have even said that uh, they were the Caesars of Rome. The ten horns could in even symbolize ten trading blocks or areas of the world being created with leaders over each of them, such as the three countries of North America is being brought into one. That is why the borders are being destroyed and people are uh, creating a North American Union. But then there's also a South American Union. Then there's the European Union. And then there's the ASEAN trading block, the Association of Southeast Asian Nations. But there is also the Af Africa Continental Free Trade Area. And so I see 10 trading blocks that are being created all over the world that will have kings or leaders that will arise to lead those ten trading blocks. And, uh, and at some point, they are going to give all their authority to this man that will come on the scene. We have seen the spirit of the Antichrist at work throughout history arising again and again during the last several centuries. But still, in this last and final battle, the Antichrist will be revealed for who he actually is, the incarnation of evil, who violently opposes all that is good and even God himself and craves to be worshipped as God in the temple of God. Daniel the prophet also wrote, about a powerful beast with ten horns. Let me take you to the book of Daniel. A little horn among ten. I'm going to read to you from Daniel 7, verses 7 to 8. After that, in my vision at night, I looked, and there before me was a fourth beast. He's already spoken of four beasts, now he's, uh, we don't have time to go into all of those. We're just focused on this fourth beast. And there before me, he says, was a fourth beast, terrifying and frightening and very powerful. It had large iron teeth. It crushed and devoured its victims and trampled underfoot whatever was left. It was different from all the former beasts and it had ten horns. Notice that. 
while I was thinking about the horns, there before me was another horn, a little one, which came up among them, and three of the first horns were uprooted before it. This horn had eyes like the eyes of a man and a mouth that spoke boastfully. So this reference to a little horn speaks of the Antichrist. So let's read more from Daniel about what this man will do when he comes to power. Verse 20 of Daniel 7. I also wanted to know about the ten horns on its head and about the other horn that came up, before which three of them fell. The horn that looked more imposing than the others and that had eyes and a mouth that spoke boastfully. That, that's a big hint. When he comes on the scene, he'll be boasting about himself. Verse 21. As I watched... This horn was waging war against the saints. I don't like that, but i got to read it because it's there in the scripture, plain as day. As I watched, this horn was waging war against the saints and defeating them. Until the Ancient of Days came and pronounced judgment in favor of the saints of the Most High, and the time came when, hallelujah, they possessed the kingdom. He gave me this explanation, verse 23. The fourth beast is a fourth kingdom that will appear on earth. It will be different. He's talking about Rome. But then he talks about the ten toes of this last kingdom. And that's what we're focused on now. Let me just briefly share. King Nebuchadnezzar has this, this dream, and Daniel interprets the dream for him, and it's of four kingdoms that arrive on earth, and at the very end of the timeline, it's a timeline of successive kingdoms, on earth, with the fourth one being Rome, but in the latter days, latter stages of this political system, it will become ten toes. And uh, the rock, if you've read the passage, there's a rock cut not by human hands, speaking of heaven, that comes from heaven and destroys the whole system of Satan. And we're seeing a picture in Daniel 7 of the destruction of these four systems and the last vestiges of the Roman uh, uh, continent and, and system. Verse, verse 23, let's focus on that. He gave me this explanation. The fourth beast is a fourth kingdom that will appear on earth. It will be different from all the other kingdoms and will devour... The whole earth. So those who are preterous, Rome didn't devour the whole earth. It was mostly in the Mediterranean basin and the European countries. But here, this last vestiges of this political system. <laughs> Isn't it interesting that America is even, uh, we call it the Senate. Uh, we... There's so many things that are likened to Rome. Our political system is taken from Rome even. And I'm not saying that, that America is this. I'm saying that ten, ten kingdoms will arise out of the whole earth. And that is what uh, we see happening uh, before our eyes. So let's have another question. This more imposing little horn, the Antichrist will wage war against the saints and defeat them. So what do you perceive is happening here? What does defeat look like for the saints? Go for it. I'll give you a few minutes to ponder, discuss that. These ten kings are spoken of in chapter 17 of the book of Revelation. So we're, 
We're still away from that. We'll get to chapter 17 in several weeks. But let us just reference it now because it goes along with uh, our thought of 10 kings. Revelation 17 verses 12 to 14 says this. The ten horns which you saw are ten kings who have received no kingdom as yet, but they receive authority for one hour as kings with the beast. These are of one mind, and they will give their power and authority to the beast. These will make war with the lamb, and of course with the saints. So, to further study that thought, I've left a link uh, in your notes for you to click on and explore that whole topic of, of a ten-nation confederacy, which I believe will be ten trading blocks, power blocks that will arise. You can click on the link and especially uh, uh, go to one hour, 35 minutes in, and you will read the commentator or hear the commentator talk about that. So the whole world will come under this fourth kingdom's power or the latter part of it, chapter 13, verse 8 of the book of Revelation. This, I see that we are already in the beginning phase of this plan to conquer the whole earth. And we have been living in uh, the power shapers, moving puppets around all over the world to put men in place to gain control over all the things that I mentioned, the political system, the banking system, food, medical system, etc., etc. So let's talk now about this man, Paul the Apostle, wrote of this evil leader calling him the man of sin, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 3. Daniel called him a little lamb, a little horn rather, Daniel 7, 8 and verse 19. John the Apostle called him the beast in Revelation 11, verse 7, and the Antichrist in 1 John chapter 2, verse 22. So the word Antichrist can have two meanings. Number one, it can signify one opposed to Christ, the antithesis of Christ. It can also mean, instead of Christ, a pretender who will present himself as a Christ-like figure, one who will arise during dark times and set the raging sea of humanity back on its feet. And when we study the breaking of the seven seals and specifically the four horsemen of the apocalypse, we read about the first horse being the white horse. Uh, and isn't it interesting that there was a white horse that was running uh, in this big fiasco at the, that preceded the Olympics. Did you notice that a white horse? Some people say it was a gray horse. No, it actually was a white horse. So they kind of roll it. They, they want to get you understanding these things uh, so that they become normal to you. So they're continually doing things like this in Super Bowls and riding of beasts, for instance. You remember that Super Bowl? I can't remember who it was that came in riding on this huge beast. And of course, that's straight out of the book of Revelation. So this, uh, this man will have a fatal wound. Uh, chapter 13, verse 3 and verse 14. And many believe that he will die, but instead his wound is miraculously healed. Isn't that interesting? The whole world was astonished, notice that, and followed the beast. The Greek word used here, thaumatso, means to wonder, have in admiration, and marvel. The emphasis in this verse seems to be that one of the ten leaders is killed, but comes alive again with the whole world admiring what this man 
can accomplish through his overcoming of death, making himself out to be Christ. All of a sudden, he's resurrected, almost as if he's Jesus, not riding on the white horse. If you're familiar, uh, in the, in the, later on in the book of Revelation, Jesus actually comes on a white horse. And so here, this man is mimicking Jesus, and he wants the whole world to acclaim him as the Christ. And we are not to believe him at all. And uh, this deliverance from death will cause great wonderment all over the world. How can this guy overcome death? What, what is going on here, they'll say. And there'll be a growing belief by those that are not aware of the scriptures that this man is God. He's, he's, God has come in the flesh. And uh, he will proclaim himself as God and seat himself in the temple of God as well. And this healing will likely be a great and powerful deception. Why, why do I say that? I can say that because th th we are told of a lie that will be told, such a great lie I'm speaking of 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 11, where it says these words. For this reason, God sends them a powerful delusion so that they will believe the lie. Not a lie. It's the lie. It's going to be such a massive lie that uh, it, it will convince many unbelievers Wow, this man really is God because he's overcome death. In the original Greek, the definite article is on the words, the lie. That's why it's translated with the lie rather than a lie. With the power of technology behind him, he will be able to listen in on all our conversations almost as if he was God on earth using IoT, as I already mentioned, and, and the power of television, radio, internet, etc., etc. With 5G technology being introduced, your TV is listening to everything you say. And the enemy is acquiring all kinds of knowledge that will be used in the future uh, with all the... Uh, the, the currency of the future is data, and you probably know this. They are grabbing data on every person on earth. So dark forces of this world system will that do their best to try to control all commerce and food, which is why you will not, there will be many people that will not be able to buy or sell unless they have the mark when this system is set up. It'll be easier for non-Christians to compromise and give in rather than stand against this man. They will just, okay, if that's what it takes, then give me the mark, they'll say. All Christians will refuse that mark. Why? Because going along with the mark will be that you must comply to worship the Antichrist and Satan in taking that mark. And many will conclude that nobody can stand against this man. He's gained control of the whole world. Verse 4 of chapter 13 tells us, Satan will give this man his power and authority over the whole earth, Revelation 13, 2. And it says, as we already read, that he will wage war against the saints, the body of Christ, and perhaps many will die at his hand rather than bow their knees and acknowledge the Antichrist as God. Three of the horns, according to Daniel 7.20, will fall, which leads us to believe that three of the ten leaders will de be deposed from their positions or perhaps killed as the Antichrist gains power. So now let's move on 
to the second passage in chapter 13, verses 5 to 10. Let's read the passage and then discuss that. Verse 5, the beast was given a mouth to utter proud words and blasphemies. This is going to give us a hint when this man comes on the, on the world scene. And this is what God is showing us ahead of time that will encourage us when we are, when hopefully it won't be a, our generation. I think that there's going to be several years, although it is not good to gamble such things. Uh, we should always believe that the day should be today. But there are prophetic scriptures that are yet to be fulfilled, and that's what we're looking at now. Verse 5, the beast was given a mouth to utter proud words and blasphemies and to exercise its authority for 42 months. Again, we notice that that's the second half of the seven-year period after the abomination of desolation, three and a half months, 1260 days, three and a half years, as we've already talked about. Verse 6, it opened. It opened its mouth to blaspheme God and to slander his name and his dwelling place and those who live in heaven. It, notice that, again, it doesn't say he, it says it. It was given power to wage war against God's holy people and to conquer them. And it was given authority over every tribe, people, language, and nation. All, all, all inhabitants of the earth will worship the beast, all whose names have not been written in the Lamb's book of life, the Lamb who was slain from the creation of the world, and oh, glory be to his wonderful name. This plan has been in operation from the very creation of the world to draw a body of people. I trust all of us in this room and all those listening to this uh, video. There has been a plan that God is unfolding his plan and even showing us the evil as it takes place so that we may understand that everything God has seen Nothing will escape his view, and we only can watch the wonderful things that God will do in those days. It may seem dark, but I also believe that there will be a great outpouring of God's Holy Spirit on the earth as men and women all over this world begin to see the scriptures really are true. And they can see in plain day these scriptures being, unop being opened in front of them and played out on the world scene. Verse 9, whoever has ears, let them hear. If anyone is to go into captivity, into captivity they will go. If anyone is to be killed with the sword, with the sword they will be killed. This calls for patient endurance and faithfulness on the part of God's people. Revelation 13, 5 to 10. So just like Adolf Hitler, have you ever seen any videos of Adolf Hitler speaking uh, in his parades uh, before the German people? It's, it's like he has charismatic, I use that word, charismatic power, obviously demonic power, not, not God, godly power. But he, he, if you've ever seen pictures of him uh, speaking before hundreds of thousands of people in front of him, he's on his tiptoe and passionately speaking. This man, the Antichrist, will have the same spirit in operation in him, and we should not be surprised that he might not look like Adolf Hitler, but some of his behavior, his charismatic behavior, his magnetism will draw people to himself and trust him, unfortunately. 
And I would not be surprised if one can only access the internet on your phone or your device by something coming up where you have to bow in front of an image on your phone or your device so that you can have access to the internet. Of course, that is not written in scripture. It is just the way my mind thinks of how will he demand worship and how will he control the internet. Um, I'm sure there's a number of things. Only believers in the God of Israel will refuse to worship him, which will be why the Antichrist will wage war against them. He cannot stand that people will not accept him and disobey his power and his authority. To the Antichrist, there can only be one God, him. He will finally fulfill his dream of being worshipped. And Isaiah chapter 14, verse 14, speaks of that desire of Satan to be worshipped as God. And in fact, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 4, says something similar. He will oppose, the he obviously is the Antichrist, he will oppose and will exalt himself over everything that is called God or is worshipped so that he sets himself up in God's temple proclaiming himself to be God. When that takes place, you know there's... That's the proof that this man is the Antichrist, along with a number of other things that we've already spoken of. Daniel the prophet continued to speak of this man and the blasphemies that come out of his mouth. Let's go to Daniel 7, verses 24 to 20, 27. Verse 24, the ten horns are ten kings who will come from this kingdom, the Roman Empire we're talking about. After them, another king will arise, different from the earlier ones. He will subdue three kings. We already talked about that. He will speak against the Most High and oppress his saints. Any, anyone felt oppression lately? We are seeing the spirit of the Antichrist at work in our day. He will oppress his saints and try to change the set times and the laws. Oh, I wonder what that is. The saints will be handed over to him for a time. I take that to be a year. Times, double a year, being two years. And half a time, being half a year. 12, 60 days, 42 months, etc., etc., three and a half years. But the court will sit, verse 26, and his power will be taken away and completely destroyed forever. Then the sovereignty, power, and greatness of the kingdoms under the whole heaven will be handed over to the saints. Hallelujah, what a day that will be. The people of the Most High, his kingdom, speaking of the Lord Jesus Christ, his kingdom will be an everlasting kingdom, and all rulers will worship and obey him. So one last, one last uh, uh, scripture, one last question. What do you think the scripture means when it says he will try to set, he will try to change the set times and laws? What laws and set times do you think will be changed? And how are such things already leaning towards this time? Go for it. Give you a few minutes. So, he will try to change the set times and laws. I wonder what that could be. Are we talking here about the Christian holidays he's going to completely abandon? The spirit of the Antichrist has already tried hard along that. They... They don't want you to bless one, an one another and say, Happy Christmas, notice. It's happy holidays. And, uh, and, and it's all about Easter and the bunny rabbit. And forget all about the resurrection. Those, those are things that are being set aside by this world system. 
But I think it could be more than that. The whole system of law in this country and throughout Western civilization, the Judeo-Christian ethic, I think, is what we're talking about. They want to get rid of that completely and bring in paganism, which will, I, I believe, be the new religion that is going to be pushed and pushed hard. So there will be persecution against those who will still try to hold on to their holidays and focus on the Lord Jesus Christ. And this will bring persecution in itself. But persecution, brothers and sisters, has never destroyed or defeated Christianity. It has only stimulated the church to grow more and deeper in the Lord Jesus Christ. So what does it mean when it, when it says that, uh, uh, that he will gain an advantage over us? Uh, what does it mean that, uh, where does the passage say? Uh, how are such things leaning today, in our day? We are losing the culture war. That is where we, the enemy is gaining ground over us. And it's not persecution. That will not defeat uh, the church. We are being defeated on the culture war. What do I mean? We are called to be salt and light in this world. But we have abandoned our positions and the enemy has pushed hard against any kind of godly uh, walk or ethic at all. And now we're seeing complete abandonment of such things. And we are losing that culture war and the enemy has gained ground for a period of time. As the days get increasingly evil, the influence of the godly upon society has gotten weaker. Remember when the movie, well, I wasn't around when the movie came out, Gone with the Wind, it came out in 1939. Clark Gable spoke his famous D word to Vivian Lee, Lee or Lay? Lee, in response to her tearful question, where shall I go, she said. Frankly, Scarlet, I don't give a... I can't say the word. It shocked the USA so much that it was front page news. Compare that to today and you will see how far believers have been put to sleep and desensitized in our modern culture which is growing increasingly darker at an increasing rate. Scripture tells us of this sleep, that, of this culture war by believers. Remember the parable of the ten virgins? Do you remember that all ten virgins fell asleep before the coming of the Lord and they had to be awakened? And of course, five of them were wise enough. That really speaks of the day, days approaching the coming of the Lord that the the culture has so infused itself into the church to the point where many people are spiritually asleep and need to be woken up out of such spiritual slumber to put on the Lord Jesus to, be, to shine brightly in the midst of the darkness of this day. So these are scary things and I, I'm very aware uh, of I'm talking about difficult things, think, things that a pastor does not like to talk about. You know, you, we're given so much uh, time to talking about the enemy and what he does. A any preacher wants to tell about the good things. But uh, I, I have, I've made a vow to the Lord that I will tell the truth no matter whether it's dark, whether it's light or whatever. I, I'm devoted to speaking through the whole book. And if it says that there'll be dark times, then I got to say it and stand before the Lord and be faithful. He has called me to be faithful, to speak the truth, no matter what, how painful or how fearful. 
in all of these things that we talk about, we are not to be fearful. We are to be more and more faithful as we see these things take place in front of us. We are to be reminded of the Lord Jesus and his words where he said, Surely I am with you always, even to the very end of the age. So don't, don't spend time worrying about what you'll do or how you will. Now, I believe there's some wisdom as we see things happening which we've already spoken about tonight, but uh, this is the preparation place. There, there needs to be some preparation of our hearts so that we, we are not falling asleep. We are not allowing this culture. We are to be people that will resist the enemy and he will flee from us, not acquiesce to everything he wants to do. Godly people should arise in these days and say, no, no. We are not having, we are not doing what you tell us to. And they push, and then when you push back, they'll ease off, and then they'll push again. And the trouble is it's so incessant. And day after day, he will wear out the saints of the Most High. That is his tactic. He's slowly going to push and push and push. And unless you are solid in your faith and resistant to the spirit of the Antichrist that is already at work in this world, then uh, you could acquiesce into saying, okay, I'll take this mark and I don't want any of you to do such a thing because it, chapter 14 tells us we'll, we'll wait until we get there to hear that warning in scripture i certainly believe ever anyone ever been on a train in england there's lots of trains so if you travel in england you're going to get on a train and and before you take your journey you get your ticket right and your ticket is what allows you to travel on the train what am i talking about god will give us the faith to ride that journey, if we are called to be those people that are there in that time and see these things take the, taking place, God will give us the faith. And in fact, I think it will be no fear. I think that it will be excitement. As we begin to see these things take place and we know the prophetic scriptures, there will be an excitement in our hearts as we see and know that the Lord is with us. When Shadrach and Meshach and Abednego got thrown into the fiery furnace, who was there with them? There was a fourth man, Nebuchadnezzar saw. Wow, who's that person? There's another, there's four. I only put three in there. The Lord was in the fire with them. And has he changed? No, the God we're talking about never changes. He never sleeps. He never slumbers. He is there with us and he has promised I am with you to the end of this age. And we need not be in fright, uh, afraid of these things as they take place. So how do you know for sure that your name is written in the Lamb's Book of Life and that God is with you and you are with him? Have you chosen Christ? Have you trusted him for salvation? So if you are uncertain... you. There's plenty of places. You can go to my website and download, and I'll put a link in the notes. How can I be sure of my faith where you can go over these things just to make sure that uh, you are walking with him and he is walking with you? So here is a mystery. We choose Christ, but we only choose him because he has first chosen us. I, oh, that is a mind bender, I know. But God knew you before the foundation of the world. He is working his purpose out. And he's not going to suddenly drop you because of any difficulties or troubles. He is training us for eternity. He is training us in how to overcome through prayer and spiritual warfare. One last passage in the book of Ephesus, in the book of Ephesians. Paul writes these words in Ephesians 1, verses 3 to 5. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, 
who has blessed us in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing in Christ. For he chose us. Do you like that? I, I love that. I love the thought that he chose me before I chose him. For he chose us in him before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless in his sight. In love, he predestined. Oh, that's a big word. He planned out you. He planned out your parents. He planned out all kinds of things. And even the dark things he has allowed you to go through. He predestined us for adoption to sonship through Jesus Christ in accordance with his pleasure and will. So on that great day, my brothers and sisters, may you be found in him. And may we rejoice together, be it in the air or in heaven. I like to think that as we're going up, we're going to do high fives. I told you, I told you, he's true to his word. He's true to his word. And they're hitting our hands with one another and say, hallelujah. The Lord God Almighty reigns. And we will be with him forever. Let's stand and pray. And, and uh, we'll come back next week and, and continue our passage through chapter 13. Father, we're just so thankful for uh, everything that you have promised us, Lord. And we pray, Lord, if there's anyone here tonight that uh, does not know you after hearing these uh, Difficult words, I pray that you would touch their lives, fill them. And if you are one of those, invite the Lord Jesus. Here's a, a short prayer that you can pray. Dear Lord Jesus, I'm aware that I am a broken person. I have sinned. I have walked away from you. And tonight I want to return. I want to come back to you. I want to give my life to you, Lord Jesus. I want to walk uh, with you in heaven, Lord. And, and I pray and invite you into my life today. In Jesus' name, amen.